Hey guys, how's it going? It's me, Josh Halter, owner and founder of The Bio Dude. I'm actually here at my point of sale, The Bio Dude Houston. You can come visit me Monday through Friday, 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. Saturday, 10 to 2. Hit that like, subscribe, notifications button. I have a very special guest with me today, a guest that all of you have seen on my channel before. I got Mariah Healy of Reptophiles. Hey guys. Uh, we're really excited because we've been planning our part two uh, YouTube series for a while. And today, Mariah, we're gonna talk about something that's really, really important. Tell my viewers, what are we gonna be discussing today? Today, we are talking about heating. Yes. And yes, that's a very simple topic, but it's actually a lot more complicated than it looks. Yes. So that's why today we are gonna talk about all of these different ways of heating reptiles, what is best and what applications yep. to use them. And all and what it comes down to is essentially with your heat bulbs apparatuses is a the infrared wavelengths that are created number two uh, your reptiles overall needs of temperature and gradient so making sure you're choosing the correct bulb and then of course you and I both know Mariah reptiles are solar powered mm -hmm. everything comes from the Sun that they need so essentially we're gonna just a, a talk about what the different rays are, what they mean, and what different bulbs put out different rays so you know you can provide the proper heat wavelengths for your reptile. What do you think? Do you want to get started? Let's get started. Okay, so the very first thing that we have is a whole multitude of different fixtures. Now we have, um, there are a lot of fixtures out there from Zilla to Zoomed to Exoterra. One of the biggest, most important things that we wanna look at when we come to different heat domes is your basic domes. Now there's one that are plastic on the top. So you see how this is a ceramic right here? This will be plastic. So Mariah, tell us a little bit about when we are utilizing a plastic heat dome that has a plastic top. Actually, this does have a ceramic. It has a ceramic on the inside. It has a ceramic on the inside, but the outside is plastic. So again, that is just something that there are other brands when the interior of this is plastic. So that means that we have to take really special precautions. The good news is that it still has a ceramic socket rather than a plastic socket. Yep. A plastic socket, when you're dealing with a heat bulb, is going to melt and cause dysfunction, worst case scenario, fire. But as long as you have a ceramic socket, even if the top is plastic like so, it's not as big of a thing to worry about. So this is still a safe fixture to use. But ideally, whenever you're looking for a fixture to put a heat bulb in, you want to look for the ceramic socket. Yep, it's very, That's very gonna important. That's going to be what's safest. Uh, so a lot of people try to, there are many great ways to save money with keeping reptiles. Uh, going for a plastic socket fixture that you picked up At from Home Depot. Home Depot or from Walmart <laughs> is not the way to do it. No, it's not. Um, so, and then there's also these two fixtures over here. So these are very special in the event that their application is extremely specific. Mm -hmm. So we know that these lights have a, a have a dome that usually has a reflective inside so that way the heat isn't going up into the dome it's being reflected back down into whatever you're trying to heat up mm -hmm. this has a very minor tiny version of it but this one doesn't and this is this light is because it is specifically meant for uh, ceramic heat emitters you cannot use a ceramic heat emitter in these types of fixtures you just you just can't do it. And we're gonna talk about you know ceramic heat emitters and then your nanos, which take a different size bulb. You can see right here, they make these little, and here, here we are, they make ceramic heat emitters, okay? For a fixture that is invented on the side. But Zoomed says it's safe and we've used them in smaller enclosures and I've had success with them, but I've also had these bulbs burn out a lot faster than per se some of my other types of bulbs. Um, mm -hmm. That just goes without saying. Mariah, do you have any experience using the uh, the, uh, the nanos or these wire lights? 
I have used uh, wire fixtures with ceramic heat emitters. I think ultimately it comes down to letting the bulb uh, vent so it doesn't yeah. overheat and that will prolong the lifespan of, yep. the, um, of the device. The one thing I really want to point out here, so one of my favorite things, um, I really, really like smaller fixtures because this enables cluster heating, which means you can create more even heating across a larger area. Something that we don't do very well in the reptile hobby is uh, creating a basking area that's large enough for the animal to warm its entire body at once, or at least most of its body. We often have these little spots that, you know, are this big on the basking area when you have an animal when coiled up is going to be this big. So it promotes uneven circulation and not very effective thermoregulation. So that's something I like about the smaller fixtures, the nanos, uh, and also the like a 5.5 inch diameter. Yep. Those are fantastic. The other thing I want to point out is you're going to see numbers on all fixture packages. So this says maximum wattage 40. This says up to 150 watts. That is not a size thing. That is a fire safety thing. <laughs> yeah. You are going to experience electrical problems if you try yeah. to use too big or too much bulb for the fixture that you're using. So when in doubt, always check the maximum wattage rating. And if you're on the cusp, go higher rating rather than lower. So something that we were really anxious to talk to you guys about is there are so many reptile bulbs on the market. We're not gonna tell you which ones are good versus which ones to stay away from besides red bulbs. You don't ever use infrared red bulbs. With the data we give you, you should be able to look at the bulb and get a really good assumption as to what we recommend and why. So first, I'm going to briefly talk about what are the three types of infrared. And I'm going to have Mariah kind of touch base with what the sun gives us and what those different infrared things mean with how our reptiles take in that heat. So the most important thing with heating is creating a bioavailable wavelengths of infrared. And that essentially means it's wavelengths that the, your reptile's body is able to take in down almost to the, if not to the musculoskeletal system. So that way the heat actually does its job and they can thermoregulate more accurately. A lot of times when, when you have heat rocks and other things like this that only emit infrared C, that's how you get those contact burns because of how those infrared, uh, wavelengths are going into the body. So there's infrared A, infrared B, and infrared C. And we're gonna talk about, about how they work and the benefits that they give your reptile for just basic to survive. All right, Mariah, what do you got for us? Okay, so let's start with what sunlight is. So sunlight is obviously the original heat source. You would think heat is just heat, but it's not. There are actually three different types of infrared, like Josh just went over, and believe it or not, the sun does not produce infrared C in significant proportions. So if we look at this chart, which by the way, is from yep. this lovely article by Roman Murin, I hope I pronounced his last name correctly, please don't kill me Roman, called Next Level Heating, Why Infrared Wavelengths Matter. This article is hosted on Reptifile's website yes, uh, to check out. Highly recommend reading if you want a deeper understanding of, re of uh, reptile heating, because that is one of Roman's passion subjects. So if we look at the composition of sunlight, so this chart is from the article. Most of it is visible light. Okay, that's the stuff that you and I can see, even with our weak human eyes. The next greatest proportion that's coming from the sun is going to be 32% infrared A. So that's the strongest, deepest penetrating wavelength of infrared. Yep. We've got 14% infrared B, so smaller, but still significant. And then I know I said it doesn't produce any, that's a lie. It's 2%. It's a very, very small percentage of the composition of sunlight. Of the infrared C. Mm -hmm. And yep. then of all of what the sun produces, 8% of it is going to be ultraviolet. Ultraviolet A and ultraviolet B. I believe this is based on what we get on Earth, so this is not including ultraviolet C emissions. Yes. Okay. And when you look at bulbs, what we want to look at as reptile keepers, lovers, enthusiasts is, is my bulb creating the optimum wavelength for reptiles to be able to synthesize the heat in the way that the sun provides them? So first, let's talk about, oh man, I, let's talk about halogens here.
for for the for the first halogen. Or it, it is my favorite type of it is my favorite type of bulb here. Hi, Gre hi Greta. Hi. Okay, so I really love the halogen bulb. So Mariah, tell us a little bit about, from Roman's study, about why the halogen bulb is so effective when it comes to heating um, provially heavy reptiles to thermoregulate. So when it comes to the question of what is the best form of heating for reptiles in captivity, I am almost always going to say a halogen bulb, and here's why. Because we just talked about the composition of sunlight, let's look at the composition of what a halogen incandescent bulb is going to be producing. So 38% of its output is infrared A. That's pretty close to the percentage that we get from sunlight. And it's the majority of the heat that the reptile is going to be receiving is, or not the majority, but a very significant proportion of the heat that the animal is receiving is going to be that deep penetrating infrared A. Infrared B, 39%, great proportion of another very strong yep form of infrared. Only 12% infrared C, and believe it or not, if you've ever looked at a halogen bulb and been like, huh, that's a little bit dim considering the wattage, that's because only 11% of its output is actually visible light. So in case you're having a hard time kind of Gra grasping. visualizing or grasping the differences between the three forms of infrared, here's something that I find really helpful. When you go out on a sunny day, you, you know, you're wearing a t-shirt or tank top or whatever, you put your arms out and you can feel this tingling warmth on your skin, right? That's not UV, as I've had some people um, uh, say to me. It's actually, you're, f you're not feeling a sunburn coming on, you're feeling the infrared A and B wavelengths going deeply into your skin. And so when you, even when you're feeling hot, you go inside, you try to cool off, it takes a while to cool off because those are very powerful wavelengths of infrared that heat you up deeply and for a long time. Now, infrared C is when you are, have you ever been to a restaurant and you know, you've sat outside, we've probably all done it thanks to COVID, and they've got this heat lamp on, right? It's usually some kind of radiant heat panel, etc. so dim red glow and a nice warmth. So it feels good when you're under it, but then you get out from under it and you're just as cold as you were before. That is infrared C or radiant heat. And that's the difference of what your reptile is feeling when you are using something that produces significant quantities of infrared A and B yeah. versus something that's only producing infrared C. Yep. And when you have an animal that's solar powered, you want to be using the sun's wavelengths. Of yes. course, there are nocturnal species. We will get to how yes. to heat them appropriately. Yes. But we need to move on. So next after that, we have our typical in incandescent bulbs. So uh, these are not halogens, which means nope. these, how, these are typically um, driven in the aspect um, of, of carbon, if I'm not mistaken. No, so, this is an incandescent, incandescent oh, as the, well, or the, incandescent the, filament. Very similar, just a slightly different type of filament. They're got not it. carbon. Okay, got it. So a lot of times, this is when you'll see a lot of your different, so this one's mm -hmm. a spot version, and then you have your normal, um, yeah, there we go, thank you, your normal, you know, ones that are not spot. But they all essentially function in the same, besides heat output, but they function in the same way in the way of what they put out with when it comes to the mm -hmm. wavelengths. But a lot of these bulbs sometimes have different colors to them. And when you're dealing with nocturnal animals, that's something that you really want to, I don't wanna say stay away from, but really understand your animal because those bulbs are for you, not for your pet. Yes. So we're always gonna tell people to throw the red bulbs in the trash because Reptiles see that. And when you turn that red light on at nighttime, guess what? They see an entirely red glowing environment, which is not natural whatsoever. So when we have things like a daylight spot and a, and a, a nighttime heat lamp. So when we, let's say we have a, we live in Minnesota, which gets really cold during the winter. We have Crested Gecko. And our house is getting at, at, at 60 degrees and we need just that little bit of an oomph. I can't find mm -hmm. a ceramic heat emitter is a night is a nighttime bulb like this that's not 100 watts it's lower wattage what is that going to function for my for my critter or should I try to stay away from anything that provides a type of color 
with a nocturnal animal's house, depending on the brightness. You definitely want to avoid, uh, the first thing, the worst thing that you can do is provide a blue bulb. Blue is very disruptive to basically all forms of eyes and it can be damaging as well. So stay away from blue incandescent, blue LED, especially blue LEDs. Yep, these are so Those bright. are terrible. Yep. Now, this is, if I'm correct, not necessarily a blue bulb, it's more of a black bulb. Yep. So it's not gonna be producing as much color as it is heat. If you can't get a ceramic heat emitter, radiant heat panel, um, or even a heat pad, this is gonna be a little bit better. Now, heat pads can be used on small scale attached to the glass of a enclosure to add just a little bit of ambient heat. It doesn't work well in larger enclosures, but it can work in a pinch in the smaller ones. And of course, you have to still make sure that, it's therm uh, that it is thermostat regulated so that the animal can't get burned when it crawls over the glass on that surface. Yep. Something to keep in mind, similar function to halogens. If I have to pick halogen first, Incandescent second. Yep. Sometimes, this is what I use for animals that need a very low basking temperature, where I can't get a halogen bulb that is actually weak enough to meet the needs. I will go for the, That's your the average incandescent yeah. bulb yeah. to kind of meet those needs, um, provide a good spectrum of heat, without uh, compromising the quality of care. Yep, um, and again, that's just, uh, you kind of you kind of want to look in your area, but again, we're always going to shoot for halogens if you're trying to trying to provide daytime heat. And at nighttime heat, there are, uh, there is one more option for daytime I wanted to show you guys. So this is a mercury vapor bulb. Um, so these are probably, these are my favorite types of bulbs. So what's really good about these is these also, pr uh, these emit UVB as well. So one really important thing is you cannot touch these gloves with your fingers. You cannot touch these gloves with your fingers. The oil in your hand will damage this bulb mm -hmm. and reduce its effectiveness. So if you touch this bulb, you want to make sure that you wear a pair of gloves um, and you want to make sure that you're using a one, a fixture that can handle the intense wattage that this bad boy is going to put out and if it isn't a if you're not going in like a standalone arcadia fixture i recommend using like a wire yeah. light something that's going to allow any excess heat that may be coming up to be able to dissipate out appropriately yes you definitely want to vent your mercury vapor bulbs yes. very very well yes another thing to remember about mercury vapor bulbs actually and especially if you'll remember the uvb video that we did we that a couple too. years ago so uh with any i'm just going to grab this yep with any mercury vapor bulb, you absolutely have to use a solar meter. Some of them are much stronger than others, and even when you look this at the back... This one's very strong. So, Exoterra does not actually tell you the UV index that you're going to be getting from the bulb, which means you do not know... You're not going to be able to put these numbers in an effective, uh, into an effective means of knowing exactly how far your animal needs to be away from the bulb to get the UV that yeah. is appropriate for its species. A solar meter 6.5 or 6.4 R is going to tell you the UVI and be able and allow you to be able to use this bulb effectively. Exoterra's is different from Zoomed's and it's different from Mega Ray. Every They're single mercury yeah. vapor bulb has a slightly different output. Make sure you are using a solar meter if you want to use one of these. You may need supplementary heat or UVB lighting in addition to um, one of these. And the reason we say UVB additional is because reptiles aren't supposed to bask 12 hours a day. Nope. They bask a couple hours, if that. Yep. The rest of their time is they're in a cool zone or they're just out chilling somewhere where they feel confident that they're safe because they're living in the wild mm -hmm. where they're going to get predated on. So having UVB throughout the, throughout the cage that still gives them areas to get away from it when using in conjunction with this bulb is really important. So then we get to our next form of lighting, which are ceramic heat emitters. We all know what ceramic heat emitters are. They've been around forever. Um, and ceramic heat emitters, um, they primarily emit infrared C, which is just like heat rocks. And as we know, uh, heat rocks are a no bueno with when it comes to reptiles. UVC, uh, the, the, sorry, the infrared C is also comes big time out of the ZoomEd or any of the under tank heaters. And that mm -hmm. is essentially in the same directive that Mariah was saying. Remember if you're in a restaurant, that you're under a heater, you get out of that heater and you're like, God, it's cold. 
you know, it's the exact same principle. So Mariah, Mariah tell us a little bit about these ceramic heat emitters and all this good stuff. Okay, so pre up to this point, we have talked primarily about daytime heating. What about nighttime heating? Yes. And what about lightless heating? Say you've got a large enclosure and you're just not getting those ambient top temps where you need them to be. You have a tropical species, your home temperature is 72, the animal's comfortable at 80. What are you gonna do when the heat lamp's not enough? you add radiant heat. Yes. So in a smaller enclosure, that's going to be a ceramic heat emitter. In a larger enclosure, that's going to be a heat panel. Now, ceramic heat emitters are not a good form of primary heat. They are supplementary yep. heat only. If you need to warm up your ambient temps, I was trying that's to get what out. you need. If you need a basking spot, do not use a ceramic heat emitter. Like we've said, they're not, the heat doesn't really do much for them. All right, so that's overhead heat. Great for heating the air inside of an enclosure. What about heat from underneath? What about belly heat like people keep talking about? Belly heat. All right, so yes, <laughs> in nature, a lot of reptiles will definitely sit on a nice warm rock. I will say I will sit on a nice warm yep. rock. It's a very comfortable place to be. That heat from below is awesome. You want heat from below and above. You want heat from below as well as a warm ambient temperature to promote healthy circulation and effective thermal regulation. These can be an awesome way. My favorite way to use a heat mat is actually for creating a, a perfectly temperature regulated warm hide area. When the heat lamp isn't cutting it, I will add one of these bad boys sandwiched between a black plastic box hide and a piece of flagstone just right in between there. Mm -hmm. So you're gonna be getting some radiating heat downward into the hide. And then I'll use a thermostat to Boom. make sure it stays at optimal temperature. So something like this with a heat pad always. or with a ceramic, ceramic heater, heater. Always, a always, always. Pulse, a pulse style thermostat is fine. It's not gonna damage it too much and it's going to be able to regulate the temperature that you want. If you are using a halogen or an incandescent bulb, guess what? You can still use a thermostat with these and it's actually highly recommended to do so, yep. especially if you live in a home where the daytime temperatures, nighttime temperatures tend to fluctuate a lot over the course of the year. When you need to control your temperatures and keep them tight in a traditional lamp dimmer isn't doing the trick, investing in a good thermostat is critical. Yeah, and with a thermostat, uh, like, I always tell my customers that come in here, if you are using under tank heater, you must use a thermostat. Yes. If you're using a ceramic heat emitter, you must use a thermostat. Um, if you have a very large enclosure that's indoor, in regard, if you need a very high hotspot or whatever, I highly recommend you use a thermostat if you're using high wattage things, just because of the sheer fact of how hot they get. You know, it's just, it's kind of like a, it helps keep things on a safer keel mm -hmm. with when it comes to fire safety and your animal safety as well. One last note on the heat mats before we go. So a lot of people will talk about the danger of heat mats burning reptiles and that's why you need a thermostat. Yes and no, actually. Any kind of under belly heat, so whether it's a heat rock, whether it's a heat mat, whether it's heat tape, etc the animal's in contact with the heating element and it, the, if the air surrounding it is not warm enough, then what happens is the heat concentrates on the animal's skin yep. and it's up to its blood to be able to carry that heat away from the skin and circulate it throughout the rest of the body. When the air temperature surrounding the heat mat is too cold, what happens is, remember, these are cold-blooded animals that rely on heat to regulate their metabolism. Their heart rate is too slow to effectively carry the blood away, carry the blood around the body at a fast enough rate to take that heat away from the skin. The heat accumulates in the skin, and that's what causes burns. So yep. even in theory, with the thermostat, if the ambient air temperature isn't high enough, the animal can still get a burn. That's why it's, that's another reason why it's very important to make sure that your ambient temperatures are high enough that you are using overhead heat. And yes, in conjunction, kind of in conjunction with this. This, this again, if it's, if you're using it as your primary heat source just to raise a very couple degrees, you still really want to try to look at that and say, okay, maybe we can try a nano instead 
and actually used either an incandescent or a small halogen bulb mm -hmm. for something just to raise us because it'll be a lot more energy efficient that way when it comes to the animals synthesizing mm -hmm. the wavelengths um, going in through the blood as Mariah said. Does this mean that you should use halogen heating at night for nocturnal animals? No. You absolutely must make sure it is dark for them in order to regulate their uh, biological rhythm correctly. Yeah, photo That's, period, super important. That has important. major hormonal implications. Yep. So what you want to do for nocturnal animals is have a daytime source of heat, preferably halogen, going on during the day simulating sunlight. At night, if you need temperatures, uh, air temperatures to be higher, use a ceramic heat emitter yep. or a radiant heat panel. And if you need to provide a warm hide, a place where they can chill, Keep that on during the day, use a under tank heater, and maybe for a couple hours after sundown as well. But other than that, night is a time for the enclosure to cool down. And the animals, you, and even in the wild, nocturnal animals still warm up during the day and cool down at night. Yeah, that's why you find a lot of them out as the sun's going up and the sun's coming down because mm -hmm. that's their chance to take in what they need so that way they can do their gig at night. Yep. Um, one last thing I really wanted to touch base on is here at the Bio Dude, we really, we check our enclosures pretty frequently. We use a solar meter to check our bulbs to make sure our reptiles are in the right Ferguson zone. Uh, but we also use a lot of equipment to make sure that our hot spots are correct. Um, and one thing that I personally love to use, I bought this at Lowe's. This is $24. It's, just, it's, called a, it's called a temp gun. And you literally point it wherever you want and it gives you the temperature. If you don't want to spend that type of money, you can also go with a, you know, my thermometer, hygrometer. You can put the probe wherever you want. And it'll give you, you know, uh, an accurate reading for what your hot spot is. You can move the probe mm -hmm. throughout the cage to give you your, you know, a, a semblance of a temperature gradient. But understanding mm -hmm. your rep, your pet's temperature gradient is extremely important. Um, just because, again, solar powered reptiles, we want to make sure that we replicate the natural habitat as closely as possible because at the end of the day they're still wild animals and that's our duty as keepers to make sure that we mimic that as much as possible to give them the chance to thrive in captivity and taking care make sure that you are dialing in your temperatures so you have the right amount of heat provided for the animal is very important the heat needs of a crested gecko are very different from the heat needs of say a Euromastix. yes entirely and uh again all of this information you can find down at the description uh we also have a link to that uh study uh at the bottom that you can click on as well as the pictures uh for the for the different wavelengths from the different bulbs if you guys are interested you guys know me i'm josh halter owner and founder of the bio dude you can visit my store monday through friday uh, 9 to 4, Saturday 10 to 2. Uh, like, click, subscribe, all that good stuff. And I am Mariah from Reptifiles. Check me out on Instagram and, of course, reptifiles.com. The dude abides.